did you all come here to learn about? Oh, geez, cyber security. Bananas. Oh, Not bananas. Okay, one more time for Jim's sake, because he's listening online. Technology. Technology. <laughs> Right. So, um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to present to you Jonathan Street, uh, Steeland. He is currently the Chief Innovation and Security Officer at BotDoc, as well as formerly uh, was the Chief Innovation Officer. Operations Officer. Or uh, Strategy Officer. Strategy Officer, excuse me, at the National Center, uh, Cybersecurity Center. So um, if you have any questions regarding industry or, uh, or governmental um, you know, cybersecurity related questions, feel free to ask them afterwards. Um, and hopefully you're gonna hear a lot more today about other opportunities in these fields for you. So um, with that, yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, I guess everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, before we get started, um, if you guys don't mind, I'd just like to take a quick little poll in terms of uh, the interest around post um, school uh, uh, work, careers, et cetera, as it relates to cybersecurity. Um. Oh, so I am potentially looking to how how do we get small businesses and medium-sized businesses on board? Yes, amen. Well, by cybersecurity insurance, they think it's never going to happen to them, so how do we get them to get on the train? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a great thing. Yeah, money helps, yeah. <laughs> but they often don't have a, <laughs> as much of it, so they think. Um, so it's a matter of just helping them figure out, figure out that what, what that, is. That, 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 that is. a that is that is a nut that has to be cracked um, because that is often, in, from a supply chain perspective today, the the the, the, the lowest um, hanging for for whether it's getting into defense, you know, big defense contractors who have their stuff all buttoned up, or large corporations. Like I was at, at Fujitsu for 15 years, it's those smaller players right now that um, are just the least, you know, are the carriers. Yeah. So who else? Oh, come on now. This is going to be a tough uh, hour here. If not. You have permission to just pick on Okay. So what? I uh, so the question is, um, uh, what, what, what's uh, your interest in cybersecurity? Um, uh, as it relates to school, are you are you looking to get into cybersecurity as a profession, or not? And not's fine. Um, my goal as part of tonight is help. You know, I'm used to going into classes like this where I ask how many people are interested in cybersecurity, and I rarely get more than three hands raised. So I'll just go ahead and ask that: How many of are you are interested in cybersecurity? Yeah, that's good because this is a. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you're feeling a little, a little bit better, Garrett. So that's good. Um, uh, you know what? Uh, um, I'll go ahead and give you the military um, uh, bluff approach, which is the bottom line up front uh, of what I'm going to talk about today. Which is, cybersecurity is not a black or white issue, right? It, it is a full spectrum, multi-dimensional matrix of pathways and opportunities that collectively uh, equals what I call freedom of movement. And I'm going to talk about my 20 plus years um, uh, in cybersecurity, covering everything from starting with the DOD to working with the third largest um, technology company in the world, Fujitsu, to working with government, and then um, doing what I'm doing now, which is entrepreneurship. Um, but a career basically in cybersecurity provides uh, a lifetime of exploration uh, and unlimited opportunities. Uh, for growth, and contrary to what most people think about cybersecurity, uh, the goal is not to achieve safety. Uh, it, it, it's not. Actually, uh, the goal is to um, uh, determine calculated risk so that it provides a com uh, um, sustained competitive advantage, uh, whether it's for business or for your career or your life. And so, um, speaking of risk, I'd like to give you a little story about um, a little risky episode that I had uh, early um, in my career. And uh, how many, uh, any, any thoughts about what, you know, a lot of times as kids you have an idea of what you want to do when you're growing up. Maybe it's a firefighter, a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, or something like that. Any idea what, what, what mine was? Uh, you probably won't guess. So um, uh, I wanted to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. 
Uh, I wanted to be a skydiver. I mean, my, I swear, I, I, I ate, slept, and breathed um, the idea of jumping out of a perfectly good airplane um, with, uh, 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 with, with a board on, uh, a skydiving board, and doing just upside down helicopters uh, and just surfing through the air. That's, that's what I wanted to do. And so um, when I uh, joined the Army, I thought uh, it would be straight out of high school. I thought it would be a perfect opportunity, a good time to do that, right? Because the Army is a good place to learn how to parachute, and it is. Um, but my timing was off, and so I only had two options at that time. Uh, one was to uh, uh, pay for pay for school, uh, or or to go. To, I mean, to uh, go to airborne school, or to pay for college. And I chose the latter. <laughs> um, but towards the end of my service in the army, uh, I just had this lifetime itch that I couldn't get rid of that I had to jump out of a perfectly good plane. <laughs> right. So against my fiance's. Uh, better recommendations and advice, uh, I found a little place out in the middle of Oklahoma that supposedly offered uh, certified skydiving classes. Um, and th there's a couple pieces in there that should just get, give you an idea of where the story's going. Um, but so one morning I get up really early, four o'clock in the morning, I drive a couple hours out literally to the no middle of nowhere in Oklahoma and um, uh, walk up and there's a big red barn and a trailer. And I go and knock on the door of the trailer, uh, and some six foot eight old English paratrooper dude comes out. Um, I mean, looks like he may have been smoking some stuff, uh, and uh, uh, said, Welcome, invited me in, asked me if I wanted a coffee. I said, Yes. He opened up the fridge, grabbed some, a Tupperware, it was probably two, two day old coffee, put it in the microwave, heated it, and gave it to me. Uh, and then commenced to sending me down and, and basically signed my life away in paperwork. That's the only thing he did right the whole time uh, <laughs> from a policy and, 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 a, and a legal and a risk perspective for his sake, not mine. Um, and so we, uh, after that was com uh, thoroughly completed, we commenced to going out to the barn and uh, uh, um, all of a sudden a little Cessna 172 Skyhawk airplane uh, showed up. And if you've ever seen those, they're not... They, they, they don't instill an entirely a, a whole lot of confidence in the mission ahead, right? They're basically a two-seater little plane. Uh, he had stripped out the back seats. That's where we hunker down in the middle. Uh, he gave me a little G.I. Joe walkie-talkie, uh, and, and as we got up in the plane, um, and uh, I thought I was going to be basically doing a tandem shoot, uh, which is by law required prior to doing a, a, a solo. Um, uh, he said, pointed to the walkie-talkie and the altimeter, he said, make sure you watch that and call me if you have any problems. And uh, I, said, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? You're not going with me? And uh, he said, nope. And he said, you're on your own. And uh, so I vividly remember stepping out of that little piece of junk plane and holding onto the wing and just praying as I, as I, as I jumped off. And at first, it was great. It was meeting my dreams that I that I had as a kid, um, and I I did periodically, you know, keep checking the altimeter. Um, but for some reason, it it seemed to stay at the same place <laughs> until I realized that um, I was obviously moving a lot faster than the altimeter was showing. And so then I hit it like that, and all of a sudden it went into the red zone, which meant that I was supposed to have pulled the chute probably, a, uh, you know, 15 seconds earlier. Uh, and so I did, and nothing happened. <laughs> and, uh, and I pulled and pulled again, and nothing happened. Uh, so then I pulled the reserve, thankfully there is one, uh, or was one, and it came up, but it was a tangled mess. Now, you know, the way parachuting works is typically you're supposed to, in those situations, just cut, the, cut all the rope, uh, because your chances of actually landing um, with a tangled up parachute are, are, are slim to none. Obviously, I didn't have that because that was my last option. So uh, I sat there in, in midair, panically, trying to pull these, these cords apart. And I'm doing 360s like this. And finally, I just get a little bit of air up underneath the chute, and the thing pops open. And uh, at that time, uh, I'm completely disoriented. I have no idea where the drop zone is actually at. Um, and fortunately, I landed in a freshly plowed field. Um, and I say, uh, fortunately, because uh, had I followed um, uh, the guy's instructions, um, I would have somehow had to make it as a first-time solo 
uh, jumper in the middle, uh, uh, close to the red barn, of which on the left were um, uh, red bulls, and on the right was an electrical field, of, of, of which I, I, I most definitely would not have survived that. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was an amazing uh, experience <laughs> <laughs> that um, I, will, I, will, I will never uh, actually do again. Um, but, uh, but, you know, what, would you, what do you think that, um, what, why do we think that, that, that parachutes exist? Well, most, I mean, it would seem logical, right, that it, it's to keep, you know, bad stuff from, from actually happening. Um, and, and the lesson of that, the moral of that story is, 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 is know thy shoot, know thy parachute. Um, uh, or at least know the guy that packed it before you, because um, what I didn't realize until I was already down was the guy that packed my shoot for me was exactly in my same shoes and had no idea what he was, what he was, what he was doing. So there were some fundamental processes broken out broken through this, through this entire thing. Um, but, you know, what I want to get across is, 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 is parachute versus brakes and, and the mindset from a cybersecurity perspective, right? Because um, contrary to what initially comes to mind in terms of parachute and brakes, the goal is not to, to slow you down or to stop. The goal is to make you be able to fly or make you be able to drive and make you be able to go fast. Otherwise, brakes wouldn't be created and parachutes wouldn't be created. And that's the beginning of what I want you guys to start thinking about in terms of um, the multidimensional, full spectrum um, abilities that cybersecurity as a career has to, has to provide to you. Um, and so cybersecurity really is, a, is, is what I call a three-dimensional matrix um, consisting of three personalities, I guess you could say, uh, a hacker, an innovator, and an entrepreneur. And the best cybersecurity professionals actually encompass all three of those at different times. Uh, and what do you think is the common trait between uh, all three of those? Risk seeking. Yes, yes. The, 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 the ability to embrace risk uh, and what I refer to as adapt and overcome. It's a mindset, it's a mindset. What's the difference between all three of those? It's the motive. Right. Um, if you look back at history, you look at Einstein, you look at Steve Jobs, you look at Bill Gates. They were all three, and many, many other successful people were as well. Right. Um, you look at their biographies, and you'll see that they did a lot of hacking early on uh, in, in their careers. Right. They were also, uh, also um, obviously strong innovators, um, and they were also very highly. Um, uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs, but it's the mindset um, that was common among all of those, and uh, the motives really for a hacker is exploration, uh, for an innovator is creation, and for an entrepreneur is launching something, right? And so uh, the common theme among all three of these motives, as she just uh, kind of alluded to, but is what I call freedom of movement. Uh, which is what ultimately cybersecurity uh, is about. And that's just a massive misconception that a lot of people have today because when they think, most people think of cybersecurity, they're th typically thinking of HBO's Mr. Robot. Um, they're thinking of the, the common hoodie uh, hacker, uh, and they're either thinking it's a black hack or a white hack, um, but it's somehow all about hacking. And that's just not the case. Uh, a career and a lifetime in cybersecurity is a full spectrum journey that allows a lot of different deviations. Uh, but the key to it is having a map and a guide, right? When I say a guide, mentors, and I'll talk about some of the ones that I had. But when I consider the map, um, I consider three core components that make up that map for a successful cybersecurity journey from hacker to innovator to entrepreneur. Right? And I can't take credit for the first one because some guy happened to be a Chinese uh, military strategist 2,000 years ago who wrote a book called The Art of War came up with the first one called Know Thyself. Um, but the second one uh, is Know Thy Enemy. And the third one is Adapt and Overcome. And whether you're talking about de developing a, strate uh, a strategy for business, for cybersecurity business strategy, or you're talking about 
designing um, uh, a, a career and a lifestyle in cybersecurity. Um, it, it, it typically, in my opinion, needs to follow in that order, knowing thyself, know thyself, I mean, know thyself, know the enemy, and adapt and overcome. And so I'd like to, um, if you guys are okay with it, just share a little bit about my career in cybersecurity. Um, it started about 20 years ago, and it started in the Department of Defense. And it was, um, it was a great environment. In fact, 20 years ago, um, I don't know that even the term cybersecurity existed. Uh, certainly the profession didn't exist. And absolutely, there were no programs like the ones that you guys are sitting in right now. Um, and so it was, it was the school of hard knocks uh, figuring this stuff out. Um, but uh, really, the only place that you could do it um, uh, was in the military or the DOD. And I was fortunate enough to, to do that. And I remember being in Atlanta one day um, on some, uh, the security training that they had sent me to for firewalls. And the lights, I had a vision, lights clicked on, and I remember calling my wife and saying, sweetheart, there's two things I know. Uh, one, I want to do cybersecurity for the rest of my life. And two, I don't want to do it in Lawton, Oklahoma. Uh, so um, at the time, the way to get jobs was just to post them up on LinkedIn. And of course, that was, you, you know, you immediately got a job. I landed a phenomenal one with the third largest technology company in the world, Fujitsu, basically the, I, the Asian version of IBM, uh, with 510 uh, companies, not subsidiaries, companies, each with their CEO all the way down, 180,000 employees in 100 uh, countries, and um, very little, if any, cybersecurity program or dedicated cybersecurity team. And so this was a uh, culture shock <laughs> for me <laughs> coming from the DOD uh, because um, uh, unlike the DOD, uh, uh, I mean, nobody questioned why we were doing security because it was our business. Nobody questioned how we were going to do it because we had programs like the DITSCAP, uh, which stands for Defense Information Technology System Certification and Accreditation Program. And the fact that I can still remember that 20 years later should tell you how ingrained it is into the mindset of that particular community, and it still is today for good reasons. But I basically felt like I had joined the wild, wild west. <laughs> and we had a lot of issues that needed to be addressed within Fujitsu, very few resources, no mentor, and no playbook to figure it out. And so one of the first projects that we designed that ultimately turned out to be very successful uh, is I, um, uh, we funded a, a friend of mine to create a, a software program called SRP. Uh, that we called security resource planning. Uh, you can now think of uh, the closest equivalent to it would be the GRC, the Governance Risk and Compliance uh, Technologies like Archer and et cetera. But back then, um, nothing like that existed. And it would turn out actually to be the easiest sell uh, of my entire career, which was in my first year <coughs> with the Jiu-Jitsu, um, which was really weird because the CFO just signed off on it like that. And looking back now, my former boss, the, the now um, global CIO at Fujitsu, you know, we often joke about what, what, what worked there? What, what, why, why did the CFO you, you know, just instantly sign off on this thing? It was because it was presented to him in terms of uh, equating um, the ability to manage security risk for the business and the investments that needed to be made in countermeasures uh, to bottom line impact and things that, that matter to the business. Right. And that and, and, and I realized very, very quickly on that my ability to translate technical uh, risks or hardcore cybersecurity issues into business language meant the difference between me getting the resources I needed and not. And we were, through that approach, able to build out a cybersecurity program at that Fujitsu company in Dallas, then expand that into the Americas. Uh, 26 Fujitsu companies through creating a shared services division. Uh, and then globally, I was the, uh, uh, the first chief information security officer for Fujitsu. And so it was a great sandbox as an entrepreneur for 15 years uh, to really understand how the business worked. Because for me, while I enjoy cybersecurity, um, and I do geek out about it some, the main purpose of it is the freedom of movement to understand how all the pieces work. And that's the know thyself. That's the hacker part of it. That's just 
amazing fun. In fact, what we did with the SRP program was we created um, a process where we would do security audits on hundreds of Fujitsu companies. We eventually, in my first startup in Dallas in 2015, um, commercialized this entire capability and called it a Know Thyself Assessment. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about what that looks like um, so you have an idea of a good way that I know works um, of, of developing a cybersecurity strategy within a business. Right? And so that process typically needs to start with what? Know thyself. <laughs> and how do you do that? Through a combination of different ways, starting though with the business impact analysis. And so for me, this was extremely interesting to go around, meet with the heads of all the different departments and divisions, and basically ask them a handful of questions, which is, you know, what matters most to you and how much? And we weren't asking them compliance issues. We weren't asking them really, we weren't really even talking about security. We were just talking about and asking them, what are the three to five mission critical capabilities that if they were compromised from a confidentiality perspective, an integrity perspective, or an availability perspective, would have a material impact on your division and your ability to contribute to the overall broad mission of the company, right? And the cool thing is, everybody loves talking about themselves, right? <laughs> so in 30 minutes, you can abstract a, a, a tremendous amount of intelligence and as you're going around and doing this, you're basically putting together a, a puzzle, a puzzle that very few people, with the exception of maybe the CEO and a handful of other executives, really have that level of intimate understanding about how that entire business ecosystem works. And it's fascinating, right? And especially if you have a hacker mindset of understanding where all the crown jewels are in the business, why they're important, so that was the first piece of the puzzle. And of course, we did a technical assessment after that, and then we did a controls assessment um, uh, after that. And it was those three components that came together uh, into a database that allowed us to prioritize our risk. So that was very, very effective. But what we then started realizing was, you know, we're, we're, we're getting good traction um, uh, and buy-in uh, on, on this program. But something started happening around 2008, which was kind of freaky. Uh, and this gets into the know thy enemy part. In 2008, we started, my team started getting a lot of uh, weird inquiries from end users about odd things happening on their machines, which at that time was really unheard of, but now is more common. Like you're sitting there um, and your mouse just starts moving on the screen and your hand's not on the mouse. Uh, or files appear or disappear on your, on, on your desktop or in your file system. Right, just kind of weird things like that, that um, we just assumed were protected because we had the typical traditional antivirus products at, at, at the time, the McAfee's, the Trim Micros, the Symantec's. What we realized though, after a short period of time, and after sending sample after sample to these different vendors, only to come back and for them to tell us that, this is interesting, we've never seen this before. <laughs> uh, we're creating a unique uh, digital uh, uh, signature uh, uh, for you, and we're going to push it out to you first and then out to the rest of our clients. After that started happening over and over, I, started, I, I realized that there's, there's, some, there's a shift going on out here. Like something, something is, is new is emerging. And what we were starting to see was the emergence of nation state actors um, really targeting commercial entities. And um, what we realized we needed to do was get us some intelligence, right? Now, at that time, the only way that you could get a good intelligence product was from one of the three-layer agencies. Uh, and as a foreign-owned company um, uh, in the U.S., operating in the U.S., we weren't necessarily privy to that, right? Um, but fortunately, a new company had come online called Eyesight Partners, uh, now acquired uh, uh, by FireEye. And they were the first commercial threat intelligence providers uh, to bring hardcore, unclassified threat intelligence, just like you would get from the fort from NSA, uh, to the commercial sector for those commercial companies like ours who could pay millions of dollars to afford it. But at least it was, at least it was possible, right? And within that intelligence um, was just a gold mine of information. <coughs> The biggest one, though, was the TTPs, the motives behind these threat actors. And so now we had a mapping of, through the Know Thyself assessments, 
of the crown jewels of what was being attacked. Um, and we could combine that through the threat intelligence, understanding of the threat actors of who was attacking us, why they were attacking us, what they were looking for, and how they would do it. And so that was wonderful information once we actually got to a point that we could operationalize it. And it's the operationalization uh, of, of all of this that really takes some time to, to, to mature. Which brings me to the third point, adapt and overcome. So one of the reasons I enjoy cybersecurity as much today as I did 20 years ago, even more, um, is because of the fact that it's constantly changing. Um, any cybersecurity professional that you meet that claims to have some sort of arrogance um, or haughtiness about them that you, you know thinks that they have it all figured out, um, you, you should you should fire them or run away from them as quickly as possible. Uh, because once you understand and appreciate the breadth and the depth of cybersecurity and the fact that it's not just limited to the technical components, although that within itself is an entire world of SQL databases of web applications, of new technologies like I refer to as the four horsemen of software-defined networking, IoT, blockchain, and artificial intelligence. Um, but it also includes policy. It also includes um, uh, lawyers. It includes HR. And today, more than ever, we need individuals, regardless of their title, role, or responsibility, to be thinking like a hacker, to be thinking like an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur if you're in a large company, um, and to be thinking like an innovator uh, with a cybersecurity mindset that is embracing these new technologies because um, most of the cybersecurity professionals just want to stop them from happening, and that's not going to be possible. Uh, in the next 10 years, uh, every major industry is going to be impacted by one of those four horsemen, one or more of them. And so um, you guys in particular are at just the most um, ripe, uh, exciting uh, time in our history to embrace the cybersecurity either profession or mindset um, uh, as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur within a large corporation because they need positive disruption in terms of business transformation. And so going back to adapt and overcome, how we realized we were going to pull all these pieces together in a short period of time and increase the operational resiliency and maturity of the security program within our lifetime was through training. Um, just like the military is really, really good at training, most companies are not. And that is one of the three keys to unlocking this whole thing. Only after you know your assets, <laughs> know who's attacking you, and then you can develop the processes and train the people uh, and incorporate the right technology to be able to make a difference in near real time. And so the way we did that was we engaged uh, with that particular company, iSight Partners, and we started having um, these war game simulations. Uh, the first one started with just one or two Fujitsu companies in Dallas. Uh, then um, as we crept up to eight or nine of these uh, simulations. We had executives and teams coming in from all over, uh, all over the world, from London, from Tokyo, from Australia, et cetera, and participating in a full spectrum Tom Clancy-like experience. Um, and that to me was probably one of the funnest parts of my job at, at Fujitsu was um, being like Tom Clancy and writing the narrative for how these three-day simulations would play out where there was enough realism of things that had either happened or almost happened to make everybody get really nervous and start sweating. And it's amazing what happens when you have technical people in a room and you have X3 letter agency folks uh, um, actually hacking you in real time and you, as the red team. And you've got your team, the blue team, uh, defending in a simulated sandbox environment like, they're, like the network that we were responsible for. But then also you have executives and lawyers uh, in the same room, maybe separated by a pane of glass, right? And that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Because there's not a single company who, if they have not tested their incident response plan, um, uh, uh, it works. It, it, it just doesn't. And until you get it into 
uh, a heated um, environment like this where you're walking through people through um, what is commonly referred to as a tabletop exercise, but what I'm describing is so much more, multimedia enhancements, things of that nature. And you're putting everybody on the spot and you're asking the CEO, sir, we just got a, a, a call from, or man, we just got a call uh, from the White House and uh, President Obama wants to know uh, why our critical infrastructure uh, has been compromised. Um, that was a very real um, potential scenario for that Fujitsu company because they worked on critical uh, infrastructure telecom telecommunications um, uh, equipment for the biggest uh, telcos uh, in the US. And in that scenario, it's things start hitting the fan, <laughs> right? I mean, people really wake up and you appreciate both sides of the fence, right? The executives have the ability, have, are, are able to see firsthand how hard it is for the technical teams to find that needle in the needle stack, which is terribly difficult, right? When you're dealing with millions and millions of alerts and events coming in as a security operations center and you're trying to weed through and figure out what, which one you're actually going to spend your biggest investment on, which is your human time, right? Every detail matters and it is not easy. And most executives have never spent a single hour in the security operations center. So they can't appreciate that unless you put them through some sort of exercise. But guess what? The technical teams have a hard time appreciating the pressure and the heat that these executives are under too, because now all of a sudden, uh, whether it's the president or whether it's most definitely gonna be the board or the shareholders or, or strategic partners, like they are on the hook personally, as we know now, many of them losing their jobs, um, on being able to respond in, a, in, 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 in the correct way, in the correct, in the right amount of time, right? And the bridge between those two is what's called estimated language, right? And that's where the world of intelligence comes back into play because um, the president of the United States, presidents, have been briefed every single day since this country has been in inception by the intelligence communities on different risks to the U.S., whether they're physical, whether they're cyber, whatever they are, they've got a book on their desk uh, in the morning uh, and somebody to brief them on the strategic risks that he or she needs to deal with that particular day. And if you've seen uh, the, the Netflix show Soul Survivor and, and watch that, uh, you'll, 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 you'll appreciate the fact that as uh, the president uh, in that show um, uh, commented, uh, there, there is no good answer. There is no good answer to any uh, of those problems. Those are just really, really bad problems, and their goal, their job is to make the, the, the least worst um, decision uh, possible, right, for the country. And so the bridge between those two um, is the ability to communicate uh, technical issues uh, to executives and executives to have enough information to be able to ask the right questions from the technical teams, right? And that's why programs like this, that are multi-spectrum, that include technical, that include policy, include business, are super, super important. Because if you come out of the gates with these kind of skills and this kind of education, you are already at the cream of the crop, I assure you, in a field that is short 3.5 million jobs in the next couple of years. What does that equate to? You guys, in, you've been in school long because you're in master's programs and know the, the, law, the basic laws of supply and demand, right? That, that equals money, right? <laughs> Cybersecurity is one of the highest paying jobs right now. I saw on your website, um, um, people coming out of this are, are on average making a minimum of 91,000. I, 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 would, I would say that is, it's, 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 the potential is even much better for that. But only if you have a game plan, you have a strategy, and you have a map, and you have mentors to come alongside you uh, to accelerate that, that plan. And so um, that is my journey in terms of uh, realizing the importance of know thyself, know thy enemy, and adapt and overcome um, from a cybersecurity business strategy. Uh, what I didn't realize, though, was uh, until I, has, I was put through some uh, global leadership training at Fujitsu 
which consisted of them uh, taking 50 of us, broken into two cohorts, sending us to four countries uh, with 12 psychiatrists uh, in each cohort and doing every psychometric test that they could imagine on you, knowing more about me than my mother did before I showed up on the first module, um, how valuable um, uh, it was to truly know thyself. Uh, right, to take the different Myers-Briggs, to take the different personality tests, to take some sort of training that helps you understand your fears, uh, your, your current weaknesses, your strengths, um, and put together your own tailored game plan uh, for how you're going to handle a very stressful situation. Right? Because whether you're on the technical side, the executive side, the policy side, whatever, um, you're going to be dropped at some point into a hot zone if you're getting uh, uh, into cybersecurity, and you're going to be expected to be able to have a certain degree of emotional intelligence uh, to be able to adapt and overcome in that, in that scenario. And that's super important. It's so important that when I launched our first company in Dallas called Ziston, um, and we worked with universities like this in Texas uh, to hire people out, out of programs and bring them in, um, we, we we incorporated what uh, had been wildly successful for the Navy, which is the Top Gun program. We called it the Top Gun program. And basically, that was a bridge. Um, that was a holistic program where we would take people just like you straight out of, out of a program, out of a school, um, uh, and put them through um, a, a holistic training that happened to be <laughs> know thyself, know the enemy, and adapt and overcome. Um, and would uh, bring in um, uh, instructors that would teach on things like health and cooking and nutrition and sleeping, right? Human resiliency, right? Of course, we did the technical training too. We had one, some of the best penetration testers in the, uh, in the US leading that and teaching people how to do a full end-to-end -end penetration test um, as a consultant uh, and then um, I would teach uh, um, uh, goals and, and, and holistic life work balance uh, using the Ziegler uh, legacy certification uh, uh, coaching material. And so we found that to be extremely effective in terms of taking people from a certain level early in their career and just putting rocket fuel underneath them and boosting their, their, their careers. And a lot of those people, of which some of which I had dinner with two nights ago in Dallas, um, are now in their 20s, um, in some cases, the acting CISO for some of the largest companies in the US. And I'm not making that up. Um, and the only way that they were able to do that was because they embraced this mindset. They poured themselves into the training that I'm talking about. They were risky. They were transparent with one another. And so they built a cohesive team that was able to adapt and overcome through different missions that we put them on uh, in that business. And so, speaking of adapt and overcome, I'd like to end with uh, one particular story that um, is <laughs> extremely memorable uh, to me. Does anybody remember what happened in 2011? Something relating to Japan? The great tsunami and the largest earthquake. And you can look this up on, on, on Wikipedia. It actually, um, it was the third largest earthquake ever recorded uh, in, in human history, the largest one in Tokyo, which says a lot because Tokyo has one of the, is one of the largest areas for seismic activity. And um, it actually tilted the axis of the earth by, uh, uh, by a few degrees. It actually moved the main island of Tokyo by 10 or 11 feet. And again, you can check Wikipedia on this. Talking about rocking people's world, it, it, it rocked their world. Um, it also resulted in um, a nuclear crisis issue, right? And so I had, uh, through the training that we had done and the threat intelligence partnership that we had established with EyeSight Partners, gotten to know and been mentored um, by uh, Admiral Pat Walsh. And prior to him joining EyeSight Partners, uh, he had spent a career ending up as a four-star admiral, number two guy in the US Navy, uh, head of commander of the um, uh, Pacific Command, 
which is responsible for all branches of the U.S. military uh, during the 2011 tsunami crisis. And Admiral Walsh, who I'll refer to um, from now on as Pat, um, was responsible for providing humanitarian relief on behalf of the U.S. government to the Japanese. And he did it in such a way that the respect that he has today um, when we made trips, like I'm getting ready to tell you about, over to Tokyo, um, uh, and the Prime Minister of Japan is just so grateful uh, for the approach that they took of coming in through the back door of these homes and, and helping rebuild Japan and helping um, uh, clean up things uh, was, 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 was profound. Um, and I had the opportunity to make a trip to Tokyo with Admiral Walsh um, and it was one of my last trips of about 20 to, to Japan over my course of 15 years at Fujitsu. But this one was the most memorable because I was sitting, um, uh, actually eight of us were sitting in a traditional Japanese restaurant uh, on the 26th floor of a building in Shiodomi, uh, Tokyo, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, exactly where all of this had, had occurred uh, a number of years prior. Uh, and Admiral Walsh is sitting at the head of the table, uh, and it's myself and um, uh, another American, and then the rest of the guys were uh, Japanese assignees who had worked on my team and I had known for about a decade, right? And so Admiral Walsh was telling this story uh, about how in 2011, as he was commander of the U.S. Pacific out on one of the ships, they started getting all this seismic reading coming off the, the, the meters that they just, they, they couldn't believe because had it been true, it had been you know, the first time in 200 years of something like that. And of course it did turn out to be true. And he basically explained what we now know was happening, which was the tectonic plates under the, US, uh, under the Pacific were, were shifting. And what that resulted in was a, um, uh, massive, massive tsunami with 200 foot uh, waves which came crashing into the buildings that we were in. And then as if that wasn't enough, um, then the big one hit. Uh, I think it was 8.9 uh, magnitude earthquake, which if you've ever experienced an earthquake, I know we don't have a lot of them in Colorado, uh, but go to California, you may experience a little tremor here and there. Um, that's, a, that, 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 that's massive, right? And as he's telling this story, at that point in the story, he's saying, you know, and what happened at that point was the building started doing exactly what the Japanese engineers had designed them to do, which is to sway back and forth. And I kid you not, at that moment, at that very moment, our building started shaking. And I looked out the window towards the Pacific and towers were swaying back and forth. And I knew we had a problem. I really knew that we had a problem when I looked across the table at my Japanese colleagues who I'd known for a decade and their faces turned pale white. <laughs> and instinctively what happens in those moments, right, is everybody looks to the senior leader uh, in the room, in this case, Admiral Walsh, and we're like, sir, what, what do we do? <laughs> and as usual, he stayed very calm and collected. And he said, gentlemen, um, I know what this is. I've experienced it before and we should probably leave. <laughs> and so we got up, you know, ran to get our shoes, put them on, and you know, we ran to the elevator as fast as we could to get down to ground level. And right as we get there, boom, the elevator door slam in our face, and this sweet little Japanese lady's voice comes on the intercom and says, ladies and gentlemen, for your safety, the elevator's been shut down. The earthquake will hit in approximately 30 seconds. And I was thinking to myself, you have got to be kidding. I have dodged three tsunamis out of this country already. If I do make it out of this, it's not going to be this thing that kills me. It's going to be my wife. <laughs> right? And so um, fortunately, um, uh, there was not another earthquake. Um, and about 20 minutes later, the doors opened up. We went down to ground level, basically kissed the ground. Um, and, uh, uh, and life that day went on uh, in Tokyo, and that was a 5.7 magnitude, magnitude earthquake, which is still noticeable, com but compared to a 9.0 um, is not that big of a deal. And so what does that story have to do with cybersecurity? Any guess? Freedom of movement. 
there's a lot of there's a lot of things you could drive from that. You could drive leadership lessons, right? You could drive um, uh, the benefits of of uh, the Japanese proactively building in technical uh, systems into their into their buildings, so that you know I personally was protected, uh, uh, and millions of others in that moment. The moral of that story for tonight is this: um, that you know. If you haven't already experienced it before, at some point in your career and in your life, you're going to have something that's just going to totally rock your world. You know, it might be a death in the family. It might be a, a relationship going south. It may be cancer. Um, it could be any number of things. And your ability to adapt and overcome has everything to do with knowing thyself. And where you place your hope, where you place your faith. For me, that's in Jesus. I'm not ashamed about that. but. Um, it, it, knowing thyself is super, super important, right? And, um, uh, and knowing thy enemy is as well, because there are times in those moments of crisis where it's just going to feel like the fog of war is all around you. Right? It's going to feel like the enemy is outside. It's going to feel like the enemy is uh, inside you, uh, right? And you're just not going to know what, what to do to adapt and overcome. So, so some preparation in terms of knowing thyself, knowing thy own emotional gaps and weaknesses, uh, knowing what thy enemy in terms of what your triggers are, you know, what, um, and having a game plan, a battle plan to be able to adapt and overcome in those moments is going to make the difference in your ability to sustain and move forward. So on that note, um, I just wanted to open it up to some questions. Um, they can be about anything. Um, uh, I, it could be anything from entrepreneurship, uh, starting your own company, um, to what it's like to work in a large global environment. Uh, if you're considering working for the DOD or the government, um, we could talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um, but anything, really. Um, what led you to shift from the consulting firm down in Texas to your current position? Um, uh, 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 a few things. One. We just really felt led to Colorado. We love Colorado. We'd started over the last five to seven years as a family coming out here more and more. Uh, just really loved it. Um, uh, and then uh, we just had a defining moment and just felt like this is where we should be. We sold our house, 40, moved from a 4,500 square foot home to a 1,400 square foot with three kids and two dogs crapping all over the place. <laughs> Uh, and not really knowing how we were going to get out here. Um, and then the NCC um, offered me a job, uh, and uh, that brought us out here. Um, and, uh, um, and then my sister uh, lives in Colorado Springs as well. So we, even though have, we've only been here for coming up on 11 months, um, uh, truly consider it home. And I am truly, truly very, very interested in um, working with schools like this and, 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 and individuals like yourself and, um, you know, whether it's mentoring or coaching, um, uh, you know, just offering any assistance I can um, uh, to, you know, help shape or guide uh, your careers. That's the biggest passion of, of, of mine. Um, and especially if it aligns with some sort of entrepreneur startup <laughs> uh, because, um, even the 15 years that I was at Fujitsu because it was so fragmented in 510 companies, it was basically a global sandbox for me to be an entrepreneur, which is so exciting, right? So exciting. And um, not only is it exciting, but it's, 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 it's crucial. Because look, folks, the days of going into a corporate environment, a big, cushy, stable, where you're going to spend the rest of your life and career uh, and you're going to do one thing, are long behind us, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, y y y you know, the ones who not only thrive, but the ones who survive are the ones that are going to be going into these organizations, whether it's government, whether it's startups, whether it's large corporations, um, and figuring out how they can be part of moving the needle forward uh, on, on you know, the, the maturity um, and the success of, of that business. Um, and that's why I just love, love, love the very, very few 
programs throughout the country like this that exist. And I say few, I mean, there's, there, there are very, very few. I mean, you guys are privileged beyond belief to have ended up uh, where you're at. Um, and uh, because this whole multidisciplinary um, uh, approach that um, this school is taking with this particular program, um, if you embrace it, you know, don't just, don't just, it's very easy just to slide right into your natural state, right? It could be technical, it could be policy, it could be whatever it is, right? I strongly encourage you to, to, to embrace the, the friction, right? Embrace the friction. Don't put up walls and don't try to resist it. Embrace it, and you will just come out of this program um, head and shoulders, uh, shoulders above uh, everybody else. And your pay and your lifestyle will absolutely reflect it, right? And guess what? Even if you have some failures along the way, <laughs> At this stage, it doesn't, you know, it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> Just fail fast and move forward, right? Yes? Um, you mentioned kind of how important kind of an interdisciplinary mindset has kind of uh, been for you in your career. Are there any, like, particular skills that you've kind of picked up along the way that you thought were particularly valuable? Oh, yes. Uh, Japanese Nimawashi. So there's an official term in Japanese called Nimawashi. Um, I didn't learn this until about 12 years after having been at the company when they sent, you know, the next global leaders to this training in Tokyo. And they have a course called Introduction to How to Do Business in, ja in Japan. And they, and they mentioned the word, the, the term Nimawashi. And my first response was, it would have been nice to have known this about 12 years prior. Because my first experience experiencing it was my first year at Fujitsu, uh, where we had our largest customer, uh, Verizon at the time, basically demanding that we were going to have a real-time parts configurator tool, uh, kind of like what we take for granted today in terms of ordering a car online, right? You choose your color, choose your features, all that good stuff, right? Back then, that was uncommon. And more importantly, it was violating some, some security <laughs> laws <laughs> that they had written in Japan, right? And so my job was to go over there as the American, uh, you, you know, money-making company at that time, the golden child of Fujitsu, because I mean it was just this is the, the tip of the telecom bubble, right? Early 2000. I mean, you, we could do nothing wrong except for what I did, <laughs> um, which is go to Japan with the head of marketing, head of sales, and this master cybersecurity strategy of all these things that we had uh, uh, tested with defense in depth and Cisco's. Uh, uh, security architecture, which was the best at the time, and how we had a multi-layer DMZ, and um, there was no way that anybody could get um, access uh, from the internet into our internal SAP systems, right? And so we went over there, probably a bit cocky and arrogant, um, maybe not knowing it, but convinced that we were going to come back home with a huge win, the Japanese executives were going to say yes, hi. Um, and uh, instead, what I walked into, uh, was 10 minutes into the meeting with a bunch of Japanese executives around the room, the senior one in the middle of the table getting up and slamming his fist down on the table and looking at me and saying, Jonathan, son, you do not come over here with these crazy ideas. And as a, um, the first officer, I apologize, but these are not crazy ideas. It's been well thought out for the last six months. Um, what I had failed to do was Nimawashi, which um, is a gardening term if you look up on Wikipedia. And just as you would never take a sacred um, uh, orchid, orchid, uh, orchid tree, right, and try to plant, transplant it just by chopping up the roots and digging it up and digging another hole, moving it over here and expecting it to survive and, and bear fruit, you don't take a business idea <laughs> without doing some serious prepping. In the case of Nimawashi, that typically means three to five meetings before the meeting to work with the stakeholder to understand and the decision maker so that there are no surprises. Because what I did was I surprised him, right? And that was disrespectful. And in Japan, that's a no-no. You don't do that. But that was a lesson I learned, even though I didn't understand the term Nimawashi, um, that, that fared me well interacting with the Japanese for 15 years, uh, but just all throughout business and all throughout life is, is just like the point of intelligence, which is to avoid surprises. You've got to do some meme washing.
Um, and you've got to be respectful of people and you've got to um, uh, understand where they're coming from <laughs> um, and what their triggers are. Uh, and then, you know, taking a tailored approach to presenting your idea if you expect it to survive and thrive in terms of bearing fruit for you. Yes. Was that the only time you've been skydiving? <laughs> no. No. After that up, or before that? I went up a second time on that trip. The same company? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I intentionally left that out. Because <laughs> obviously it was not the smartest thing to do. Um, but I already paid two, uh, an additional $200 for this, and um, I didn't know how my wife would take it. Uh, um, uh, you, know, you know, losing $200 or whatever. But anyways, I went up in the in, in, uh, second time in there. This second time was even freaking worse, uh, because <laughs> um, the first time at least it was clear skies, and I could like see the drop zone and where I was supposed to be going. This time it was completely cloudy. And um, I looked at the, at the in, instructor and I said, I, I can't do this. And he yelled back at me, he said, he said, what? Because it's kind of hard here. And uh, I said, I can't do this. And he said, well, you're not getting your money back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only good thing about that is I actually didn't jump. <laughs> but I was, I was squishy in terms of Japanese a little. I was very, very close to, jump, to jumping out again. Um, Fortunately, I didn't because when I did come back, the next crew of idiots that were there, uh, one of them straight up rolled up with with with, um, with crutches because his leg has been had been broken on 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 the last uh, training incident. So definitely would not recommend you know just doing a Google search for places to skydive in Oklahoma. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Um, so you talked about know thyself and how that's part of your process. Um, and you mentioned Myers-Briggs in particular, which uh -huh. sometimes comes under a lot of heat. What yeah. other tools do you use to make sure that you're really like learning about yourself and not just putting yourself into a box that someone else constructed? And yeah. It's like a continual process. For sure. Absolutely. Um, so the short answer is treat everything like, a, like an experience, experiment. Because uh, it's, it's all about the experience, right? And so the more you can get, the faster, um, uh, be, you know, especially at this stage, because your true life risks start going up as you, have, as you get married and as you have kids. I mean, there's just certain things that you're just going to be precluded from being able to do. Is you want to you, you, you want to start by taking a, a, probably at least three different personality tests to start with. Um, Myers Briggs is is not a bad one, and, and I'm not saying that any of these are good, good, bad, or better. I'm just saying that they're common ones in the industry that have been around. That at some point, some employer is probably going to have you take, whether it's for a job interview or a promotion or something like that. So you might as well just go ahead and, and know what your you know know what your results are. But focus on the, the emotional intelligence um, uh, side of things. So so read books and take tests. Um, on, on emotional intelligence, take strength finders, you know, the disc, et cetera, um, and then kind of use those through your own lens to, to come up with a game plan and say, you know, none of these tools are perfect, um, but there's patterns here in what I'm seeing across these different tasks, and, and th these are the things that I'm going to focus on, on working on, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to intentionally put myself in a, a state of friction, in a, in a, in a, in a difficult environment, um, starting off small and getting bigger and bigger, and keep a journal. Like, I didn't keep journal for years because I just thought it was wussy and, you know, just kind of whatever, but it is huge, especially for this, like tracking, you know, how you're feeling, how you're responding, <laughs> the words that are coming out of your mouth voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, the emotions on your face, your ability to read others' emotions, um, uh, and then the, the, the success of that engagement. How do those interactions um, uh, translate into, uh, in, in, into success? Um, uh, is, uh, and then there's, you know, just spending some money and going to, on your own to, to different training um, uh, uh, things that evolve around emotional intelligence or 
you know, fortunately, if your future employer will pay for it, um, just asking them. I did this a lot at Fujitsu. I mean, there's the corporate training stuff, which kind of typically sucks. Uh, and then there's, you know, you go out and explore and find out what some of the best, you know, workshops or things you can go to. Most companies are going to have some sort of training budget, and most of them don't get used up every year, right? And so it's kind of first come, first serve. And so just ask. And sometimes you shall receive um, and, and, and put yourself in those situations because they will be like what I experienced on, in four different countries with the gold program that Fujitsu put me through. All very, very intentional uh, about um, um, exposing in a safe environment those, those, those gaps that arise uh, from knowing myself. Right? And so it's one thing to take the test have a list of stuff is another thing to experience in person. Um, it's yet another thing uh, to journal about it <laughs> so you're not repeating over and over the same, uh, the, the same things. Yes. Uh, can you describe? That was my last part of the parachute, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the third episode. Uh, can you describe? Uh... I think it was the firewall training you went to in Atlanta that you said yeah. a, a switch was flipped and you called your wife and said you want to do cybersecurity. Can you yeah. describe that? Yeah, um, it was a basic class. Um, it was uh, um, it was just a checkpoint firewall training class, which at the time checkpoint was the dominant market leader in firewalls. Um, but I think what snapped for me at that time was my ability to just because we were working with network architecture diagrams, um, be able to kind of visualize in my mind the whole, the, the, whole, the whole architecture, which is the biggest problem for cybersecurity, both people in it and absolutely for people outside of it. Like they can't see any of this stuff that's, that's, that's happening. They, uh, unlike you know, somebody going and, and taking out a bank, you know, uh, I, I mean, you know, a hundred times that amount gets stolen, you know, every hour. And, you know, people don't think of it the same way because they can't see it. And so there was something in that moment that just um, made me, uh, it, it, just, it, it just clicked. And uh, I, was, I was absolutely convinced. And, and, I, haven't, and I haven't, looked, haven't looked back. And it has, it, it has never, I've never been disappointed that I chose cybersecurity as a career. Um, but mainly because of the freedom of, of movement that is provided. You know, had I been stuck in one thing, um, it, you know, it, it would not have it, it would not have worked, and I would not be making that same comment. But cybersecurity is the legitimate excuse <laughs> to explore, <laughs> right, um, uh, everything and anything. Um, uh, and uh, my suggestion is exploit that for a win-win scenario. Anything else? Well, thank you so much uh, for your time. Hopefully, we don't all get bogged down with the, uh, uh, with the snow. But um, feel free to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to you know, have a phone call, or uh, I'll probably you know, hopefully be up here periodically um, and can meet for coffee or something like that. But if there's anything I can do to kind of answer any questions, follow up, or help uh, as you navigate into this broad and deep world of cybersecurity, um, I, it would be my pleasure. Okay, let's thank our speaker.